and uh, greetings to all of you from Orlando, Florida. Um, my wife, Molly, and I have been involved with ICC for, gosh, ever since 2011. And uh, we've loved it. Um, we have um, visited many of the churches around Europe, uh, preached, preached in a number of the churches around Europe, have been to the retreats over the years. Anyway, it's just really an honor here to be with you all. Uh, our topic is pastoral resilience. And uh, I have so enjoyed the uh, rich times in the scriptures with Kostya uh, yesterday and with Matt today. Um, and I think the book of First Peter is uh, well chosen uh, for the realities of what uh, all of us go through. So I've really been ministered to by the by those conversations, uh, and I want to thank those guys for it. And I realize that Joe is going to kind of wrap up the First Peter series uh, tomorrow. Joe Batluck, so I'm looking forward to that as well. Um, but as we talk about pastoral resilience, one of the um, passages that I wanted to read is actually out of First Peter. So this is not to steal Joe's thunder, but rather to highlight something. When we uh, hear about uh, suffering, as we have the past couple of days, which is one of the themes of First Peter, I think it's interesting that uh, the role of the shepherd comes into play in First Peter chapter five. So Peter says, "I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed." Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. And I, I often think about what a privilege it is for all of us to be pastors to be shepherds, to have that as our primary calling. Um, my guess is that each of us gets up every day, despite our suffering, thankful to God that though we're inadequate and though we are weak and though we lead with a limp, that for some reason by his grace, he chose us and empowered us to lead the flock, to feed the flock from his word, to care for people, to shepherd and guard the flock, all of those things that God has called us to do. And I, I do believe um, that each of you, each of us as under shepherds of Jesus have a target on our back. And so we are, are, we are at great risk and thus the need for resilience in the midst of all the sufferings of the job. Uh, I think being a pastor is the hardest thing I've ever done. For me, it was a mid-career move. I was in my early 50s when I became a pastor. And you're probably thinking, Mike, that is so crazy that you did that. And it might have been, but it's one of the most humbling things I've ever done. Prior to um, being a pastor, I was uh, my wife and I were on staff with the crew for 29 years. And in my last four of those years, I was a global rep. So what that meant that I was traveling in and out of Africa. Um, Europe and Canada and other parts of the world, basically working with nationals around the world, doing leadership development and uh, all kinds of other things um, in that role and training. But all along, I had a heart for being a pastor. And that's why it wasn't difficult for me to walk away from a pretty good budget and a pretty good job traveling around the world to just be the pastor of a local church. So in 2006, Molly and I worked with a, a core group of 20 people to plant Lake Baldwin Church in Orlando, Florida. Um, and uh, But as I said, it's been one of the hardest things that I've ever done. So to set up this conversation about resilience, I want to uh, tell you just a little bit of my personal story and why it's one of the hardest things I've ever done in this job. And each of us has our own story about having a target on our back and um, there was a movie actually in the 1960s called A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum. And so a lot of you younger folks might not remember that movie, but I always think of that because the way I would say that is a funny thing happened on the way to the Great Commission. You know, a funny thing happened on the way to being 
following God and being called. And that's that God wants to do a work in us. Uh, he doesn't just want to do a work through us and a work out there, but he wants to do a work in us. So um, when I became a pastor, I, as I said, I'd been in ministry, you know, for 29 years. And there were three things that I believed about myself. Uh, one is I, I felt that I was a pretty good Bible teacher. Uh, one person actually said to me, Mike, um, when people get a chance to hear you teach the Bible, your church is just really going to explode. People are going to come. It's going to take off. Secondly, I thought I was a pretty good leader uh, because I used to teach leadership development around the world. I, so I thought I was pretty good at that. And third, I thought that I was emotionally healthy. And uh, I remember when we first started our church, uh, one of the, the guys in the church would tell his friends about me. And he would say, one of the things I love about Mike, because I was in my early 50s, he said, one of the things I love about Mike is that he has nothing to prove. And uh, so wouldn't you know it, uh, we, the, the church took off like a SpaceX rocket, uh, did really well for a couple of years. And then uh, the third year was one of the hardest, probably the hardest year of my ministry life. Um, a lot of torpedoes hit our boat as a church, but um, but there were three really difficult things that happened to me. One was um, we had we did some evaluation as a church, and I had learned of some people that felt that my my preaching and my teaching wasn't connecting with some of the friends that they wanted to bring to church, and so somebody shared that publicly. I I actually think it's good to invite feedback and evaluation, but June 1st, 2008 was the darkest day of my ministry career because I invited feedback and boy, I really got it. And it was humbling, it was embarrassing. Um, and so that was one thing, I thought I was a great communicator. And then suddenly somebody's saying, hey, I'm not connecting with people, very humbling. Second thing that year, um, I led the church in some uh, bad strategy decisions. Uh, that um, really set us back. And um, I thought that I was, you know, was really good at leadership, but I um, really failed a number of times as a leader. And then the third thing that was, <laughs> was really weird, but here I was, I was, like I said, my early fifties and I thought I was emotionally healthy because uh, my wife and I had really emphasized that in our ministry over the years. But suddenly I was in a situation where people could make judgments about me and evaluate me and vote with their feet. And um, suddenly I was like a middle school kid again. And um, this guy that said, hey, Mike doesn't have anything to prove. I felt like every week I was getting up in the pulpit trying to prove myself. So just an awful year. It's, awful. it's just really an awful way to live. And uh, so I was pretty broken through that process. And not that any of that stuff has really gone away, but, um, but you know, that story and going through that and the, the humbling, the setbacks related to the funny thing happening on the way to the Great Commission for me has highlighted the need for resilience because I think that all of us uh, during our darkest days really want to quit and uh, we want to, we're not, we're not thriving uh, in the ministry and it's hard to stick with it. And I think that this year uh, has been another one of those years for many of us because of COVID and because of other issues that we've had to go through. And I, I do believe that a lot of these things are compounded because of the, the context that, that you all are serving in as well, which um, has added torpedoes, challenges, humbling situations that are likely beyond some of what I've gone through, or maybe you all don't feel, didn't have it needed as much work on your heart as I needed. But so uh, what I wanted to share with you today though is, um, we're talking about pastoral resilience. And so with, with kind of that backdrop of thinking about resilience, what I'd like to do is um, I'm, I'm referencing a book that uh, Molly and I read while we were on sabbatical a year ago last summer uh, after 
uh, many, many years, I finally took a sabbatical and visited the Holy Land, and did some traveling around uh, Europe, around the UK. It's a really wonderful time. And one of the things we did to renew and refresh our souls was to select a reading list. And one of the most transformational books for me was a book called Resilient Ministry, What Pastors Told Us About Surviving and Thriving. The book is written by three people together, Bob Burns, uh, uh, Tasha Chapman, and Donald Guthrie. And uh, what the book is, is a summary of, um, as they put it, uh, what pastors told us about surviving and thriving. So it was seven years of research of pastors and their wives in ministry and uh, a very comprehensive research process. So they com compiled a lot of this into the book. And what they identified was five themes of resilience, five themes. And so the question is uh, that, that I wanted to, um, to set up these themes for you with is this question, what are the real issues that tear down or build up pastoral resilience? Like what are, what are the issues that we have to, to um, grow in our understanding of? What are the factors that contribute to either our being torn down from our resilience or having our resilience strengthened? And uh, what I'm going to do today, of course, I'm not going to go through the whole book. I do recommend the book. I think it would be a great cohort um, topic, a cohort discussion to read through the book together and talk about it, especially with spouses. Um, but what I'd like to do is walk through and define what those five themes are for you. And then after that, I've got some discussion questions that we can go through that will uh, allow us to talk together. So that's all I'm gonna do, just a little reflection on my own story and um, to introduce the five themes to you. And then I've got some discussion questions for you. And you can think about whether these things relate to you. Um, you know, personally, as I went through the book, it, it wasn't rocket science, it wasn't new, it wasn't, um, it wasn't electrifying, but the more I thought about it, the more I realize that though I have read on these themes, I've taught on these themes, I've lived these themes, the reality is I really needed to do some good heart assessment of each of these five themes and continue to, to nurture my heart in relationship to these. I think I'm older than most of you. And so I don't know whether it's a hopeful comment or not, but you're, what I've learned is that you're never done. Um, even if you're as old as I am, you're, you're like, wow, how did that happen? You know, it's like last weekend, we had a membership class and it's surprisingly large. There were 30 people going through a membership class. And then uh, Saturday night, my wife and I were sitting down to dinner and she had some sadness in her life. And I thought I was being really good relating to that. And, uh, but then after that, we, um, somehow we got, we, we missed with each other. And uh, we just started, started we, we, we had one of those times where we go, wow, this is like, how did it escalate to this? And then my sermon, uh, which I put a lot of work into, I, had, I got up at 4.30 on Sunday morning and um, it was a risky sermon. And I was up at 4.30 writing the third draft of my intro because I still wasn't feeling good about what I was doing. And then I had to give the sermon and um, so walk into my world, but that might be your world as well. So, so anyway, you don't outgrow, uh, necessarily the need for spiritual and emotional growth. Anyway, let's go through and I'll explain them, talk a little bit about them. So here we go. The first theme, number one is spiritual formation. Remember, these are things that either tear down or build up pastoral resilience. So spiritual formation. So what is spiritual formation? It's the ongoing process of maturing as a Christian. And it's both personal and impersonal, interpersonal, meaning my personal relationship with God, but, but also my experience with community. So a little bit like what, um, what Matt was talking about, about how we do have our relationship with God and our relationship with others. Um, 
over in First Timothy chapter four. Man, I just love this. What Paul says in First Timothy chapter four to Timothy as a as a pastor, he says uh, he says train yourself for godliness. So that's his advice to Timothy: train yourself for godliness. And then verse sixteen. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearing, your hearers. So there's a pretty significant need for pastors to pay attention to spiritual formation. Uh, so one of the things you see in this book is a lot of quotes from pastors that were part of these, part of the research. So one pastor said, uh, look, I may be a pastor, but I'm an inch deep. My life is filled with incessant activity and little prayer, contemplation is foreign to my vocabulary and non-existent in my life. So uh, it's easy as a pastor to become isolated from others. Um, and so one of the things that's really a, a good question to think about is who is it that shepherds the shepherds and who pastors the pastors? And so one of the quotes in the book is, it's from a, a gal named Diane Langberg. She said, before you were called to be a shepherd, you were called to be a lamb. Before you were called to be a shepherd, you were called to be a lamb. So it's good to think about who is it that's um, shepherding you? Who is it that's nurturing you? Who's helping you with your, uh, your spiritual formation? So that's number one spiritual formation. The second uh, area, the second theme that came out um, of these five themes is self-care. Now, Greg referred to that yesterday. It might be part of the, um, the online survey we're doing about the cohorts, but I want to talk a little bit about, about self-care. Uh, it's a big theme in the book. Here's, what self, here's how self-care is defined. It's the pursuit of physical, mental, and emotional health, the pursuit of physical, mental, and emotional health. Uh, a guy named Peter Brain gave it this definition. It involves the wisdom to ensure, as far as humanly possible, a wise and orderly work that conserves and lengthens a pastor's ministry. So, um, one of the tensions when it comes to self-care is we know that Christ has called us to deny ourselves. And so we might think, wow, how does that relate to self-care? Aren't we supposed to deny ourselves? But actually, one of the things I point out is that in order, you have to deny a lot in order to take care of yourself. You have to deny excessive work. You have to deny being in control of everything. You know, you have to deny getting strokes from people. So really to, to stop and do self-care is hard to do. Um, I remember a couple of weeks ago, Molly and I got away for a, a few days of vacation at the beach. And I, I thought to myself, you know, this requires discipline because there's a lot going, around, going on around the church that needs my attention. And it, this just requires discipline to let go of the steering wheel and give that to other people. So, so self-denial kind of cuts both ways. So here's what they say about self-denying. It's called self-denying self-care may include getting to bed on time, saying no to work by setting aside periods for Sabbath and sabbatical, getting responsible exercise and eating a balanced diet. One pastor said, I'm convicted that I need to be paying attention to or caring for myself, not just the church. I've been sacrificing myself for the work and really this is not forming myself into Christ. So that's the second one, uh, self-care. Let's go on to the third theme, the third of five themes and uh, the third Third theme is uh, what they call emotional and cultural intelligence, emotional and cultural intelligence, and how important that is in the life of the pastor. And uh, one, one pastor had this quote in relationship to um, dealing with emotions. He said, when I was in seminary, I was taught 
how to preach and how to exegete the scriptures, but I wasn't taught how to exegete people. I didn't know that pastoring is dealing with people and their messiness. So, uh, so emotional intelligence is um, broken down into a couple of categories. There's, there's what they call, it's emotional intelligence is EQ. So it's EQ self and EQ others. So EQ self is being basically in touch with your own emotions. Uh, so as one pastor said, I'm, in, I'm increasing, increasingly seeing that I'm not very aware of the emotional aspects of my personality. I see weaknesses in this area and they're reflected in the church I pastor. Our church is emotionally and relationally underdeveloped. You know, I wonder how many pastors would admit that. I wonder how many pastors would face the possibility that they're not emotionally healthy and that to some extent the, the church that they're leading, their congregation is not emotionally healthy. So that's EQ self. EQ others, emotional intelligence in regard to other people. What they say there is it requires the ability to accurately discern what others are feeling and respond appropriately to them. Man, I'll tell you what, I've, I've gone through this. Uh, it's funny, in our context here in the U.S., we've actually had three layers of stress and crisis that are on pastors and churches. One is COVID, and then there's the racial tensions, and then there's the presidential election. And uh, it's amazing. we've never seen this much division over silly issues uh, in our churches. It's just it's just unbelievable. It's as if COVID has got people isolated and there's, they're being squeezed and what's inside is coming out and they're acting out in all sorts of weird ways. And so, uh, you know, you not only have to take care of yourself, but you have to think through how to respond appropriately to people. And on this EQ others, they go on to say, without this capacity of understanding the emotions of others, we tend to disregard others, whether we know it or not, while we push our own agendas, and this is not a healthy way to lead. And then cultural intelligence, um, you know, th that's a biggie in the international church, as all of you know, because you're, you know, you're dealing with people from uh, from other other cultures. Uh, we we actually have um, a lot of cultures in our church. I'd like to change the name of our church to Lake Baldwin International Church so that I could be like the rest of you. But um, so in our community group, Molly and I lead a community group that's called Gen X. And it's all the people that don't want to be millennials and they don't want to be boomers. And it makes Molly and me feel younger. So we love the group. And uh, so we've got some friends from Egypt in the group. And I don't know whether this is cultural or not, but I, I learned that um, one of the individuals uh, kind of struggles being in the group or doesn't connect with our group because we kind of share vulnerably um, about our lives and they, they, they don't really enjoy that. And it doesn't mean that somebody from another culture doesn't isn't want, willing to be vulnerable or doesn't need that or doesn't want the same kind of connection. But it might be that the way that we were going about it in our group does not create the kind of safety that this person needs. And so I started thinking about that. I thought, you know, you know, I wonder if I'm, how's my cultural intelligence with uh, this person? Because I'm seeing a kind of reaction, but I'm not getting an explanation. And so what I really want to do is try to persuade this person to kind of come around to my point of view and realize how fun our group actually is. But in reality, um, I could be missing. And um, just just realizing that, you know, is, is, uh, is part of the challenge, isn't it? And I mean, you, you all have this, you know, when you've got 30, 40, 50, 60 countries represented in your church, uh, you face it on many, many levels. So 
Cultural intelligence, here's the definition, it's the ability to recognize and to adapt to different cultural contexts, which is what all of you have done. It involves an awareness of ethnic, geographical, socioeconomic, educational, and generational differences and the implications of these differences for one's perspective and behavior. So isn't that a lifetime project growing in cultural intelligence? I mean, for all of us, isn't that uh, something that, that we wanna grow in? All right, fourth theme. It just keeps digging deeper, you all, so here it goes. And I just wanna preface this fourth theme. It's, it's marriage and family. And I want to thank Michael DeGena. It's how these, these sessions in our retreat here, our little retreat, are just connected with each other. The first Peter um, stuff and, and the Mike's presentation yesterday when he told his story, I thought, wow, I so resonated with what Mike said. And I so appreciated um, his candor. Uh, and I bet all of us could appreciate and relate to what he said. So anyway, marriage and family, it's the, it's the uh, fifth theme. So marriage and family, this theme recognizes that to sustain the stresses in ministry, pastors need to focus on spiritual and relational health with their spouse, their children, and their extended family. So, um, I love, I love this next statement about the strategic role of the spouse. When they talk about the strategic role of the spouse, they're not talking about the functions that a spouse may perform in the congregation. So your spouse, my spouse, they do stuff. They volunteer for stuff. They lead Bible studies. They meet with women. They disciple people. You know, our wives do a lot of stuff in partnership with us. But that's not what this is talking about. It's more, as they say, rather, it's the role that spouses have in sustaining their pastor partners in the work of the ministry. And uh, I, I just feel like that's so true in my life. If, if, if for some reason Molly is not, if I sense that she's not with me and that I'm missing with her, that, that's kind of a red flag because you start functioning kind of with a little bit of a double life. And um, so one pastor had this quote, he says, I, I know more than ever that I cannot answer this calling that is of being a pastor and a shepherd without my wife. She is the only person in my life who will always be there for me in ministry. And one pastor said, my family gets the scraps. And so, this, this shows up in all kinds of ways. Um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty energetic about the ministry and a, a visionary and work hard and all that kind of stuff. And I adore my wife, but one of the things that we occasionally have to check in on is, am I conscious of her, whether we're in a going out to dinner with another couple or whether we're in a public setting or whatever, am I considerate of what she is feeling in a given situation? And First uh, Peter 3 talks about live with your wife in an understanding way. And that, that verse is so powerful to me, so important. So I love this next theme and I think, it, I think it's worth talking about um, when you think about Pastors around who have been connected to ICC over the years, um, you, we all know that part of resilience is, has a lot to do with marriage and family. So finally, the fifth theme, and then we'll go into some discussion of these. Uh, this, this is one of those ones that'll make or break our resilience in the ministry, believe it or not. And it's, it's what they call leadership and management. They say that this is the area that is least discussed in seminary. I remember when I went to seminary, I went to uh, first two thirds of my seminary was at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. And I remember having a course on pastoral duties, but I, I didn't get stuff on leadership. You know, all the stuff I learned about leadership, I learned uh, in senior missionary 
leadership and uh, being part of a large organization it was, it was huge for me. Um, and oftentimes we think that the only people that really need leadership and management are people that lead parachurch organizations or mega churches. But it's not true. It'll, it'll eat our lunch uh, if we don't realize this. And so it's the least discussed area, but it generally takes up more of the pastor's time than any other responsibility. These responsibilities are rarely discussed, but continually demanded of each of us. So in order for pastors to thrive in ministry, they must accept the fact that they are leaders and managers. Um, you know, I have met a lot of pastors and worked with a lot of pastors over the year who say, you know, that's just not my gifting. I'm a visionary. I'm a teacher. You know, I don't, I don't need to get good at that or it's just not the way I'm, I'm gifted. And so there's a little bit of a dismissiveness sometimes about this area. But as they say in the book, we, pastors must accept the fact that they are leaders and managers. So leadership is, um, they, they define it as seeking adaptive and constructive change. And, and they refer to that as the poetry, the poetry of pastoral leadership or pastoral ministry is the, the, the sort of high level leadership piece. But management they define that it, it provides order and consistency to organizations, and they refer to that as the plumbing. So it's the poetry of the poetry and the plumbing of being a pastor. The poetry is again, it's visionary, change agent leadership, forward thinking, but then the plumbing is the day in day out management. Um, this includes, they point out, navigating the political realities of ministry. Uh, politics is a dirty word. This is not presidential politics, it's church politics. Politics is a dirty word, uh, but ministry almost always involves working with people and people have divergent amounts of influence and different interests. And so one of their quotes is, where two or three are gathered, there are politics. So so being uh, growing in our effectiveness and leadership and management will help us navigate a lot of the things that we have to do even relationally and politically as we lead our churches. So, okay, how's that? Those are the five themes. Um, I think we're halfway through our, our time together. Hey, I wanna give you one more quote that I think is one of the most powerful quotes from this book. And it highlights the unique challenge that we face being pastors and this, this underscores the need for all of these themes. Uh, listen to this quote from a pastor. He says, most people in our church have a life that is like a stool with three legs. They've got their spiritual life, their professional life, and their family life. So you all can think of people in your church, a stool with three legs, personal life, or their spiritual life, professional life, and family life. So for them, if one of these legs wobbles, they've got the other two that they can lean on. So if you try to keep, keep that stool up. But for us as pastors, those three legs can merge into one leg. Our spiritual life, our family life, and our professional world can merge into one leg. So in effect, you're sitting on a one-legged stool and it takes a lot more concentration and energy and it's a lot more exhausting to do that. So that's part of what makes our job unique compared to a lot of the people that are in our congregation. All right, um, here, are the, here are the questions and maybe somebody could type them and, and put them up. Um, it's one question about each of these, about not all the themes, but some of them that we can talk about. Um, the first question is, in what ways have you successfully pursued spiritual formation and what roles did others play in your growth toward Christian maturity? So that's just a little bit of sharing together. In what ways are we pursuing spiritual formation? What roles have others played in that? Uh, number two, how about this question? What stories do you tell yourself about self-care? What motivates you to prioritize the work required to pursue physical and emotional health? And so I think when they're asking this question, what stories do you tell yourself about self-care? It's one of the things that can kind of keep us from doing what we need to do there. 
Third one uh, is think of someone you know who seems to have high emotional intelligence or, or cultural intelligence, but let's just say emotional intelligence. Uh, what are they? What is that person like? Like, what does it look like for a person to have healthy emotional intelligence? Um, the fourth one is name several concrete examples of how spouses can play an important role in helping sustain their pastor partners in the work of ministry. Right. So I'll say it again. Name several concrete examples of how spouses can play an important role and helping sustain their pastor partners in the work of ministry. And then finally, the last question is, uh, think of a recent, recent situation in your church. How were the skills of management and leadership needed or expressed during that time? So think of a recent situation in your church. How were the skills of management and leadership expressed during that time? So, um, so just to um, open it up to the group, I think what I'd like to do is invite uh, you one at a time to speak up and share from, from one of those questions, just pick one that resonates with you. So we won't have time to just work through in detail all five of them or to talk about all these areas, but I would like to, and if there was one of those questions that resonated with you, I think it'd be great to hear from you on that and have some discussion. So the floor is open for that. Pick a theme, pick one of those questions and pick one that resonates with you. You know, the first thing that came to mind, Mike, when you talked about uh, management, um, when I was a young believer, I was just a few years below, old in the Lord, and uh, I went to a conference at, at Pres 10th Presbyterian in Philadelphia, and the pastor at the time was James Boyce. Maybe, maybe some of you will know him, and boy, I was just taking it all in, soaking it all in, and during one of the breaks, I went to the back, and, and there was a, a, a little switch there, and there was a handwritten note. It was taped up there, and it was James Boyce, you know, his name at the bottom of it, it says, please make sure that this stays on. Uh, something, and I just couldn't get over the fact that here's James Boyce, this incredible Bible teacher, and this is the church that he's involved in, and he's he's got this note up there on the back of the church informing, you know, whoever's going to be there of his desire. I mean, there is a picture of management that as a young believer and, and knowing that the Lord is calling me into service, I didn't know the extent to which that reality was going to be true in the work that we would do here um, or, or in ministry in general, but particularly even as you're thinking about planning a church, you know, there's so many details in the whole management realm of people and logistics and things of that nature. And those things are not easy things to do, but I, there is a man of God that I totally respect. And there he was, he understood exactly what he wanted. And uh, that was part of his everyday life. And it was right there in black and white on the, on the wall. Right by, right by that switch. Anyway, I, I thought that was just an interesting thing. And that would, that's what came to mind. And I'll close with this by saying that sometimes when we're called into ministry, we don't imagine that we're going to be as involved on that level. And we don't want to imagine it, I think, frankly, but it's really an important aspect of things. And if we can be helped in, in, in knowing how to do that well or better, uh, I think that's a really important thing. Mm. Good stuff. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, I might just comment on that. I wasn't quite sure what Boyce had written up, but it sounded to me as, as actually quite a good example of micromanagement that's going a bit too far. Uh, but the, the way I sort of tend to see it is uh, I, I see young men coming out of theological college who've been told that they've got to um, focus on the ministry of the word and prayer and everything else doesn't matter. You know, everyone else does that. And I, I find myself thinking, yes, up to a point. Of course, we shouldn't be waiting on tables and we're wanting a congregation who will provide for us so that we can dedicate ourselves to ministry, word and prayer. But we are also the paid people. And therefore, if no one's else going to do things, we need to be willing to do that. And perhaps, I mean, I've church planted as well. In early days in a church plant, you do need to be willing to, to do everything. But I'm not sure if it's helpful if you carry on doing that, micromanaging when the lights are turned off, um, throughout your ministry. <laughs> yeah. Good. Thanks. Well, well noted. 
How about uh, the rest of you, some of those other themes? Those are one of those topics uh, that resonated with you. Yeah, I'm uh, Laramie here in Marseille again, and I'll just share um, something that was really just standing out to me. Um, just seeing all you guys again. Um, you know, uh, last year, right before the conference, we were offered, we, we were able to go to Croatia. We were invited there by a group that, that focuses on self-care for pastors. And we were, we were invited there and the, the whole theme was just self-care and we were practicing it. You know, they were like, don't do anything while you're here. And, um, and we were going through a really rough time. And then we went right from that into the conference uh, last year uh, where I met all you guys and, or most of you. And then, you know, it was, uh, when I went back the next week, it was, I was supposed to be focusing on self-care, you know? So uh, I was, I was going to have a day off every week. And of course, the first day that I planned off, uh, we had, I had a true emergency, a true, I mean, it was like somebody was suicidal and I, and I had to really follow up on it. Um, and so, uh, so I plan, you know, well, I'll put it off for a week, you know? And so, um, I, the very next week, uh, and I, I've done this off and on, but it just seems so elusive. You know, it's like I can I can hang in there for a while with it, and then it goes away. Uh, but the very next week, um, I, I you know put it off, and I, I had a whole day alone with the Lord, and uh, you know it was it was awesome. I, I he felt very close, and uh, I was in the the woods in Slovenia, and. Um, felt like a good conversation with the Lord. And, and he was just, it seemed like he was telling me, you know, can you trust me? And it's like, yeah, Lord, I can trust you. And uh, so that was on a Friday. Well, that Sunday I went to church and, you know, some of you, you guys knew that there, there were problems. Well, that Sunday I went to church and, uh, and I was asked to leave as pastor from there. And so it was just like, I had this whole awesome day alone with the Lord. And then it was just like he was preparing me, you know, and then I went in Sunday and it was just like ever since then, um, you know, that's been uh, a little it's been close to a year ago. It was December 1st, actually, of uh, last year. And it's been like crazy. <laughs> and then we went into quarantine and you know, it was like, oh, well, we're in quarantine. So self-care should be easy. Right. Because we don't have anywhere to go. But uh, but it's been an elusive theme, and uh, you know I've had bits and pieces of it. So um, yeah, I, I just was gonna yeah I'm, I'm encouraged. I'm very encouraged by by you, Mike. So uh, thanks for thanks for sharing and what all of you are sharing. Well, Laramie, we really appreciate that story. You know, those of us that met you have followed your story with great appreciation and love, and for what you all how you join the work there in Marseille and it's been wonderful but I know you've got your your wife there with you and, and so I wonder if you guys resonate uh, you know what it's been like for you the role of spouses and sustaining their pastor partners in the work of ministry has that uh, not to put you on the spot but how has that been true for you guys Yeah, I'm amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we had a good uh, passionate discussion after the conference yesterday on can we continue to do this? I yeah. Mean, so, and, uh, so, I think well, it's always, a, you know, there's the spiritual warfare that comes along with ministry yeah. where you're always you know, questioning, um, can you continue? Do you have the energy or, you know, how is this going? And, um, I think, you know, I loved what you said. Like, I, I really enjoyed what you said, Mike, and I really, um, listened well when you talked about Molly and when you talked about your relationship and, I love the fact that you, it's not perfect. Um, I mean, maybe it is. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I love, you know, to listen to the imperfections in it and how you relate to each other and how you press on. And um, 
Yeah, so I, I gathered a lot from even what you weren't saying. Um, but yeah, it's um, that's the, the self care and the it, it's important and that really feeds how well I support. <laughs> If that makes any sense. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for saying all that. And it's great to have you with us, both of you. Uh, I think we've got about, uh, oh, gosh, about 10 minutes left. And so there's room to just kind of keep on talking. If you others of you would like to just comment on a specific theme that related to you. Mike, can I uh, chime in? I'm not cutting anyone else off. Um, I'd, I'd like to actually kind of combine two two of the questions because for me they they've really related. Um, I actually kind of lost my my questions here, and it's um, the one about emotional intelligence and the role of the spouse. Uh, and I want to say, and I don't I don't mean this as a slight against anyone in the in the meeting, but I feel almost like I've never met anyone with a high emotional intelligence <laughs> and myself included. I, I would not put myself in, in a group of people with high emotional intelligence. But I think one if I if I could think of one thing that would uh would be would answer that question, it's that I, I have met people who are pursuing that, who are actively engaged in gaining um or growing in emotional intelligence through growing in in self-awareness. And that's where the spouse that's where my spouse comes in. Um, that Carmi's been through um, her, well, she really <laughs> grew in that over this last two years and has been actively engaged in, in, in growing in emotional intelligence or self-awareness, uh, if I can put it that way, through a life coaching program. And then she, after she went through it and, and really was tremendously blessed by it, she went through the training in it so she could provide that for others. And I was the guinea pig <laughs> through this whole process. Um, and it just really equipped her to hold up a mirror uh, and help me to, 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 to grow in that. Um, and it's been very, it was very difficult uh, for a lot of that period to, to have someone so close to me be the one that was holding up that mirror, but she did it with such gentleness and respect that um, I was able to really listen and um, just, uh, it's been really transformative for me. Um, so that those two things have kind of worked together over the past two years. Thanks, Ross. Mike, I'd just like to say, um, this combines a few of them, uh, perhaps self-care and uh, the wife sustaining you. And that is, um, I, I noted when you said uh, self-care, I said, uh, listen to your wife. Um, and I find that that um, in my life has been sometimes um, not too well received, um, but very important um, as to um, what my perception is and what hers is sometimes varies. And uh, the fact that I have a wife that will give me her perception really enables me to kind of feel other people out. Mm -hmm. And I would say that on the health side, that uh, one of the greatest thing in my family that um, helped us is that every week, well, the majority of week, generally on weekends, we had a family time. And in that family time, we would do scripture and the calendar. And it would cause discussion and prayer. It would cause discussion that sometimes one-on-one um, -on -one would never come out, but in the family arena, um, the children or the wife shares honestly how they felt or how they were disappointed or how they were excited. And those all helped me from an emotional and spiritual standpoint. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, I share a couple of thoughts about the self-care. Mike, thank you so much for being so transparent and so you know, just so honest about the struggles that, that you faced. It, it's it's so helpful, so refreshing, and so, you know, just great to to identify with that and to say that, yeah, you know, I I, I felt a lot of those those things too. So it's it's very, very refreshing. Um I think under the rubric of self care, um we need to keep in mind that for example, you know, as we minister in Moscow, we minister in the culture 
that that sucks you dry, that you know basically works you to the bone. That you know the vast majority of people um, in our congregation are driven. They're working eighty hour week, um, you know, with very high demands. And working in that culture, you kind of catch yourself that I can't be slacking. I can't be. I mean, I, I think a lot of us are dealing are dealing with that issue of uh, having sort of to justify to to our congregation what we do because they think that all we do is just get up on a Sunday morning and, you know, do a little exposition of the Bible, and that's that's about it. Um, and so with that, you know, the culture pushes you to, you know, pushes you away from self-care. Uh, but I think we need to be mindful that as we lead our congregation, we don't lead them just an exposition of the Word. We lead them in a different lifestyle that does include, you know, paying attention to, to your spiritual well-being, to paying attention to your physical well-being and so i think that's that's one of the things that as we talk about the self-care we need to keep in mind that it's a very holistic um issue that it's not just about your you know time of prayer but it is about your time of exercise it is about your time um of keeping rest and keeping that dynamic of you know um of keeping shabbat um it is about your 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 sabbath it is about your um you know your intellectual development, and you need to be mindful about that. And as we're, you know, as we're pursuing all, and it is obviously about the the family dynamic as well. And as we're pursuing all those things, we are leading our people in a different pattern um, of living in a, you know, in a very high-paced world that is actually pushing you in a different direction. So that that's what I was thinking about when I was thinking about the self-care and how, you know how it, it encompasses a whole lot more than just one issue. Mm-hmm. Greetings from the UK. Good to see you, man. Thank you for being uh, so honest about your own uh, relationship with Molly. Um, I think I appreciated the marriage and family point, And I think um, we're having uh, Nikki Lewis. Some of you will know Nikki Lewis. She's going to be interviewed at our uh, midweek meeting tonight. And I'd formed a few questions uh, that I'd sent to her. Caroline speaks to me this morning and says, uh, have you thought about this question? Do you think that would be a good question? And I'm thinking in my head, I think, I can, I think I'm mature enough to work out which questions to ask Nikki. You don't need to tell me that. <laughs> uh, but I think there's a tendency within me and maybe with other guys here uh, we appreciate our wives, but we, we're a bit reluctant to ask for their opinions. And um, I think that's a weakness. I think if I certainly couldn't do the ministry without my wife's partnership. Uh, if, she, if she decided she would need to go and do something else, then I think that would be an end to my ministry as well. Um, but I think where I need to improve is, is to acknowledge uh, the support that she gives me. So I think that's a that's a healthy thing. A move towards uh, emotional intelligence within the marriage. Uh, the other the other thing is a question, Mike. I think on the management thing, some of us I think really feel our lack in management, you know, and the vision thing and all that. Uh, is there is there a is there a, an argument for drawing other people alongside you into a team where they they have complementary gifts which can then serve the church together rather than the one man having all the gifts um, in order to serve the church. Yeah, that's a great uh, thought, Devin. I really agree with that. I know that um, when I think about leading the church or pastoring the church, I strongly believe in a team-based approach because there are people around me that... um, are more effective at certain things. And so, yeah, it's true. I mean, there's people that are really good at budgets and I'm not good at that. And there's, you know, I could just go through the list of all the different gifts and roles in our church. Um, So, yeah, I think you're right uh, about that. Um, I think that at at a certain at a certain higher level, there's a 
we are a leader of leaders. In other words, we're, we're, we're uh, if you think of Ephesians 4 and equipping the saints for the work of ministry, you know, we do have that role of equipping our leaders, equipping our congregation, mobilizing spiritual gifts and all of that. So I do think, I think that's true. And I think that they, but you still have to um, be thinking about it on all levels. Like the, the comment earlier about James Boyce, you know, he probably would have been like, you know, if there were a deacon that could have handled that, you know, that light switch uh, is a is a good good point. Um, so I think that's real, really true. And so as, as the organization grows, I think the thing that I think we, it's difficult to escape is that we do, we are, we are leading an organization and not just an organism. And so we have to, I think we have to think on those, those different, you know, different levels. Um, so, but I think it's a good point. We do need to entrust a lot of these things to others who are more gifted than we are. It's a great point. The other thing I'd say too about leadership and management and organizational leadership is I, I used to think that it was um, a matter purely of gifting, but I think what I've realized over the years is that actually we can be developed, we can grow in it, and uh, and so that it's good to think about that. Most of these things are are growth areas for us. Was there was there one more before we wrap up? This is my this is my first time uh, joining the uh, retreat, and um, I'm a uh, very new new guy here, and I'm currently in Dallas, uh, in the U.S. But we're waiting for God's time to uh, move us to uh, New Zealand, actually. Yeah, because the COVID, everything is put on hold. But um, but we're waiting, and God is doing something amazing uh, here and still in Dallas. Um, I think as you as you shared, I really want to just first and foremost thank you so much for your transparency, like what everybody else has uh, praised God for, uh, your wisdom and your transparency. And, and I think two things really came to mind is that um, the intentionality and pro- proactivity, I think understanding, knowing uh, the five points in, our, in my head, it's so easy but how radically difficult it is to live it out as everything is falling to the plates as you serve and lead a church and i think that is one thing that you have mentioned and talked a lot emphasized a lot about how do you really prioritize yourself and and really uh help me occur the uh the story of jesus right he whatever situations and circumstances he's in with a crowd, he always really took time to uh, withdraw himself to the desolate place, and and you'll be surprised how many times he actually uh, did that, and that caught all the disciples, the off guard. That like, what what are you doing? You know, people need you here, but no, he he, he takes what self self care to spend time with, with the Father more way more important than healing, preaching, teaching and caring for the, the flocks. And I think that's one of the things that I need to keep remind myself um, that today I am not a savior of the church. I am not the one who fix all the things, but if my vertical relationship with God is, is thriving and solid, that is where my ministry will, will thrive. And, uh, I'm going to end also with one other point is that I've been praying a lot about seeking uh, my personal board members. I feel when, we, when we're pursuing spiritual formation and self-care, a lot of times that we are, we're not alone. You know, we, we try to just find ways to uh, calm ourselves and to deal with a lot of issues and struggles at church by ourselves. And oftentimes I wonder how many people are there I can talk to when I'm in crisis, when I'm going through the suffering, when I'm going through the pandemic or election here in, in the States. And the question came to mind is that 
do I have people I can trust? And those mentors can, can really guide me and call me out if I'm out of line. Are there any pastors or mentors in my life that who are able to have the permission to allow me to go to them um, and, and, and walk alongside me? You know, um, and, and knowing that this is, not, uh, this is not just sprinter, this is marathon. So you need to have people running alongside you. You're not just trying to win by yourself. This is the big church. This is what God has called us into. So that's a couple of things that I, as you share, that I really resonate. And at the same time, just such a great and divine reminder that I need to be intentional and proactive at the same time seeking uh, counsel uh, around me and, and, and just ask them, hey, I, I'm hurting. I'm in need. Uh, can I talk to you? Can you pray for me? And, uh, and lastly, you just so many cases recently has uh, revealed that many pastors, especially those world renowned leaders, has uh, been put on the pedestal. They have been falling, and I and we're not exempt. You know, when we are kind of self quarantine, uh, resting about our enemy is not resting, <laughs> it's working even harder right now, <laughs> trying to tear apart the church and divide the marriage and relationship. So we need to be on our guards, walk uh, with the Lord you know, moment by moment instead of the spirit. In Galatians 6 is one, one passage that I keep on meditating through, throughout this season. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rick. Uh, good to have you with us, y'all. I don't know if y'all heard Rick's headed for New Zealand eventually, so Europe mm -hmm. and beyond. Hey, I think <laughs> my time's up. Uh, James, um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, pitch it back to you to do the wrap up for today. Yeah, I was going to actually introduce Rick. <laughs> Rick did that himself. So welcome to the community, Rick, and we're hoping to uh, get you, you out of Dallas, actually. So, um, <laughs> but God's timing is good. Amen. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks, Mike, for sharing. Uh, I think there was so much there, a lot to take notes on and to go back and, and look at, um, you know, you starting out that we're not finished yet. Um, you know, I met with my mentor yesterday, Mel Summerall, 95 years old, uh, who recently took on with a friend, another church plant and has another discipleship program that he's developing inside, you know, and uh, it just encourages me 40 years younger, um, but still feeling very old already. Uh, to, to realize that, hey, uh, we, we need to carry on. And in doing that, these five themes, if we're going to carry on healthy, are things that we need to consider and to continue to develop. So thanks for all that, Mike. And I look forward to maybe even seeing some bibliographies from everybody gathered on, on these issues. There's a lot in the chat window. If you haven't been following the chat window, uh, Ross posted a few things and some books were um, put out there as well, some titles. So, you, and we will see you back here tomorrow afternoon for you, those of you in Europe and in the morning for Rick and I. So God bless you all.